Good afternoon. This is called The Girls. In spite of all the insults, rejections, and hostile assaulting behavior they persisted, the schools were often incredibly run-down institutions, unsafe and unsanitary, but the young people were expected to attend them and be grateful for what they had. In some more enlightened southern communities, lovely modern school buildings were built, still firmly separate but equal. What these young women rightly felt was that they should be entitled to what everyone else had and determined to fight for it. Dr. Rachel Devlin is an associate professor of history at Rutgers University since 2011. She earned her PhD at Yale University in 1998. Her scholarly interests include cultural politics of girlhood, sexuality and race in post-war United States. Her publications include relative intimacy and a number of articles tackling a subject one did not name even though we had such intimacy forced upon us. In present times, we are still grappling with, to quote Dr. Devlin, sexual authority within and outside of the Me Too movement, and everyone is talking out loud about it. This book, A Girl Stands at the Door, depicts the strong feminine presence in initiating the lawsuits before others thought them capable of it. The young women and girls were active in marching, going to jail, fearlessly facing down the men who would do them injury. They sat, sang at spirit meetings beforehand, sang as they marched, and they and the young men in the movement from their separate jail cells all crowded in to each other to keep their spirits up. They were enormously courageous. Lillian Smith comments on it in her chapter, The Crisis in the South. Contrasting how older people haver around with decisions, with the direct actions of the young people, if only she could have seen the Parkland students who showed such direct engagement with the powers that be, their response to that tragedy. These young women persisted in defiance of their own humiliations. The African American beauty shop owners were supportive of them as many of them were independent owners and did not have bosses, male or otherwise. They cleaned them up when the over-enthusiastic hooligans dumped food, mud, and anything else they could find to diminish their dignity. According to Tiffany Jill, they restored them and their morale with sympathy and love, which they could wield in aid of their sisters. A book we honor today has a story to tell that has languished unrecognized for too long. So many women's stories have not been told, but now they are coming out to the kudos they, they richly deserve. These young women saw a step they could take to help themselves and others, and they bravely stepped up and into history. I knew Millicent Brown and her family in Charleston, South Carolina, but I had not known the depth of what she had gone through to the degree that Dr. Devlin writes about. Dr. Josephine Bradley was my boss in the African American, African and African American Studies program at Clark Atlanta University, and I never had a better one. Josephine Boyd, as she was known in the 50s, integrated her high school in the Greensboro Senior High School on her own among a student body of 2,000 and took plenty of flack for her people and she stood four feet ten inches high. Many years later, our university administration tried to give her some static, but they did not know who they were dealing with. <laughs> I was working with Mr. Esau Jenkins in the Charleston area with some young people who had more or less hit a wall in a situation similar to Josephine Boyd Bradley's. They told us what had been going on. Some of them were nervous wrecks from the difficulties that they'd been going through. Dr. Devlin calls out the lack of support from NAACP, but there was Mrs. Daisy Bates, 
who had been affiliated with the NAACP, as I understand it. She met with the young people in her area in solidarity and support in the afternoons after school to help them get through the experiences they endured. We are so happy to award a Lillian Smith Prize to Dr. Rachel Devlin for the excellent work she has done in telling the world about these brave young women, some of whom I had the privilege to know and work with. Dr. Devlin could use this as a weapon in case she got into trouble. <laughs> this is very heavy. Uh, is, uh, Dr. Johnson, is somebody going to take a picture of us? Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Let's come out this way. Maybe we should have it. And let the, your name. <laughs> good. Yes. Why don't you hold it? Okay. Yeah. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, back it, back it goes. <laughs> I'm five feet tall. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be back at the Decatur Book Festival where I spoke to one of my first audiences uh, on my book tour and it turned out to be one of my best audiences. And with me was my daughter, Katie, who kept me from misspelling readers' names on more than one occasion and kept these books from the trash heap. And I appreciate her presence here so much today. And I just want to mention one other person, Dr. Roseanne Adderley, who took a bus from New Orleans to be here. And I could not have written this book without her friendship. Thank you. Thank you to the Southern Regional Council, uh, the Univers University of Georgia Libraries, the DeKalb C County Public Library, the Georgia Center for the Book, and Piedmont College. It's a great consortium of people. Uh, I appreciate so much the time uh, and work it takes to be on a jury. And I just want to uh, thank Dr. Twining Baird, uh, Meryl Penson, James Taylor, Dr. Morrison, and Dr. Stevens. Um, I also am so uh, honored to share this uh, award uh, with Dr. Eubanks um, and, and, and Dr. Walker, uh, whose book, uh, The Miseducation of Horace Tate, is a fascinating and eye-opening book, as is Automating Inequality. This is a very special award for me because Lillian Smith is a personal hero. I grew up in, in Texas, and, Dr., and, and Lillian Smith talks so much about the silence that surrounded segregation and the wound that that creates for white uh, young people as much as it does for black young people. And that book spoke to me a great deal when I was a young person, feeling very alone at my all-white high school in the mid-1980s. So it is with great gratitude that I expect this award. Um, uh, Killers of the Dream is a, is a book written uh, in the form of a letter to a child and about Lillian Smith's own childhood growing up. Um, and it's about uh, real questions that she got from campers at her camp. And um, the book is a meditation uh, on segregation and what it does to this, the human soul. And Lillian Smith took her campers' questions seriously. And she saw that in the simplicity of their young questions, that those questions reached at the heart of the hypocrisies of the South. I believe that the most important reasons Lillian Smith was and remained a true radical, not a Southern liberal, but a Southern radical, was because she continued throughout her life to listen to young people, like Ella Baker, like Eleanor Roosevelt, like Polly Murray, like Mary McLeod Bethune. She never stopped learning from young people. And I think we could all do well to keep doing that. She rejoiced in their passion, she rejoiced in their urgency, and she rejoiced in their insight into the contradictions of American mores. I believe that historians need to follow her example and listen to young people more. When young people act like the girls in A Girl Stands at the Door, it is a measure of the level of crisis that we adults have not resolved. It is a, it is a measure of our failures uh, as a society. And so it was with the young girls who took on school desegregation. 
A Girl Stands at the Door retells the story of Brown versus Board of Education as a story about the girls who led the grassroots movement that, what, that came to, and that created that decision. Girls who filed lawsuits in the late 1940s, over a dozen from rural Texas all the way to Washington, D.C., and then who, after Brown, volunteered in vastly disproportionate numbers to desegregate the schools. Those who took enormous risks to file these lawsuits and who suffered backlash from the communities in which they lived. Um, these plaintiffs, they had to walk up to a white school. They had to meet with the white principal. The principal inevitably got wind that they were coming, and he would come out and meet them on the steps. They never even made it through the front door. The principal would say to the young girl, usually 14 years old, you don't want to come here. And the girls would stand up straight, and they would speak directly to the principal and say, I do want to come to this school, usually with a smile, but with complete firmness. Girls did this all over and over again throughout the South in the late 1940s. Then they filed lawsuits. They met with reporters. They met with lawyers. I don't know if you've met with lawyers before. <laughs> but they did this as 12-year-olds. These meetings can be long, and they stuck with it. They and they also testified on the stand. They did incredible work. The most important work they did, though, was speak to the press with confidence about what they were doing. And Millicent Brown, who Dr. Baird mentioned, I'll just say one word about her. Girls desegregated schools and were plaintiffs for two reasons. The first is that they were committed to the ideal of school desegregation. The second reason is that they were good at it. They were polite, they were diplomatic, they were poised, and they were steadfast and determined. And this is what allowed them to be such pioneers. Millicent Brown, uh, her mother had been trying to transfer her to a local, uh, all white school, historically white school, three blocks from her house, since the Brown decision. Summer of 1963, her father simply says to her, put on your Sunday clothes, we're going to school board. So they get to the school board. Millicent Brown has no idea what's going on. The secretary comes out. She simply says, they're ready to see you now. She walks in, and the all-male, all-white uh, uh, Charles, Charleston school board is sitting around a table, about 12 men. They said, we have some questions for you. Do you like your black school? Do you like your teachers? Do you like your extracurriculars? Do you like your friends? Yes, 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 yes. So why would you want to leave all that and go where you don't know anybody? And Millicent Brown, unprepared as she was, shot back, because I make friends wherever I go. <laughs> and she had checkmated the whole room. And it was the simplicity and the humanity of her response, as if to say, I don't know what you do when you go to a new place, but I make friends. And it was exactly this kind of simplicity and humanity that Lillian Smith saw in young people. Lillian Smith, I believe, would not have been surprised that all these young women led the desegregation charge. She would have been frustrated, I think, that it took so long to recognize these young women. But she would not have been surprised. After Brown, um, uh, seven, six girls and three boys desegregated in Little Rock, uh, 18 girls and five boys in Baton Rouge, four girls in 1960 in New Orleans, and in Albany, Georgia, and I, I don't have to tell this crowd that Albany is in Georgia. <laughs> Six girls desegregated Albany High in 1964. And um, Mamie Ford Jones said to me, you know, that year we went over, they thought they were getting the six smartest girls. No. They got the six girls who would go. And they were very insistent on their own agency. She said, people thought we were handpicked to desegregate Albany High. We raised our hands and said, yes, we will go. There was a great deal of violence. It was relentless. It was daily. Um, it was psychological and physical. It was the teachers. They all survived, they all graduated, and every woman I spoke to said she would have done it over again. So we owe a huge debt of gratitude to these women. 
And I would just like to say that uh, going forward, I think in memory of Lillian Smith, um, we should continue to look at young people and as historians not forget what they are doing. As we look at Greta Thunberg, Thunberg as we look at Emma Gonzalez and David Hogg uh, with gun control, as we look at Opal Tometi, Patrice Cullors, and Alicia Garza who started Black Lives Matter when they were in their 20s. Um, I hope that these young living breathing young people will allow us to look back and see the leadership of young people. By awarding a girl's dance at the door, this committee is, I believe, sending that message. And for this, I am particularly grateful. Thank you.